This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. The Return of Imre by Rudyard Kipling. The doors were wide, the story saith. Out of the night came the patient wraith. He might not speak, and he could not stir, a hair of the baron's miniver. Speechless and strengthless, a shadow thin, he roved the castle to seek his kin. And oh, twas a piteous thing to see, the dumb ghost follow his enemy. The Baron Imre achieved the impossible. Without warning, for no conceivable motive in his youth, at the threshold of his career, he chose to disappear from the world, which is to say, the little Indian station where he lived. Upon a day he was alive, well, happy, and in great evidence among the billiard-tables at his club. Upon a morning he was not, and no manner of search could make sure where he might be. He had stepped out of his place. He had not appeared at his office at the proper time, and his dog-cart was not upon the public roads. For these reasons, and because he was hampering, in a microscopical degree, the administration of the Indian Empire, that empire paused for one microscopical moment to make inquiry into the fate of Imre. Ponds were dragged, wells were plumbed, telegrams were dispatched down the lines of railways and to the nearest seaport town, twelve hundred miles away. But Imre was not at the end of the drag ropes, nor the telegraph wires. He was gone, and his place knew him no more. Then the work of the great Indian Empire swept forward, because it could not be delayed and Imre, from being a man, became a mystery, such a thing as men talk over at their tables in the club for a month, and then forget utterly. His guns, horses, and carts were sold to the highest bidder. His superior officer wrote an altogether absurd letter to his mother, saying that Imre had unaccountably disappeared, and his bungalow stood empty. After three or four months of the scorching hot weather had gone by, my friend Strickland of the police saw fit to rent the bungalow from the native landlord. This was before he was engaged to Miss Eugel, an affair which has been described in another place, and while he was pursuing his investigations into native life. His own life was sufficiently peculiar, and men complained of his manners and customs. There was always food in his house, but there were no regular times for meals. He ate, standing up and walking about, whatever he might find at the sideboard and this is not good for human beings. His domestic equipment was limited to six rifles, three shotguns, five saddles, and a collection of stiff-jointed mashir rods, bigger and stronger than the largest salmon rods. These occupied one half of his bungalow, and the other half was given up to Strickland and his dog Tietien, an enormous ramper slut who devoured daily the rations of two men. She spoke to Strickland in a language of her own, and whenever, walking abroad, she saw things calculated to destroy the peace of Her Majesty the Queen Empress, she returned to her master and laid information. Strickland would take steps at once, and the end of his labours was trouble and fine and imprisonment for other people. The natives believed that Tietien was a familiar spirit, and treated her with the great reverence that is born of hate and fear. One room in the bungalow was set apart for her special use. She owned a bedstead, a blanket, and a drinking trough, and if any one came into Strickland's room at night her custom was to knock down the invader and give tongue till some one came with a light. Strickland owes his life to her when he was on the frontier, in search of a local murderer, who came in the grey dawn to send Strickland much farther than the Andaman Islands. Tietien caught the man as he was crawling into Strickland's tent with a dagger between his teeth and after his record of iniquity was established in the eyes of the law, he was hanged. From that date Tietien wore a collar of rough silver, and employed a monogram on her night-blanket, and the blanket was of double-woven cashmere cloth, for she was a delicate dog. Under no circumstances would she be separated from Strickland, and once, when he was ill with fever, made great trouble for the doctors, because she did not know how to help her master, and would not allow another creature to attempt aid. Makarnacht, of the Indian Medical Service, beat her over her head with a gun-butt before she could understand that she must give room for those who could give quinine. A short time after Strickland had taken Imray's bungalow, my business took me through that station, 
and naturally the club quarters being full I quartered myself upon Strickland. It was a desirable bungalow, eight-roomed and heavily thatched against any chance of leakage from rain. Under the pitch of the roof ran a ceiling cloth which looked just as neat as a whitewashed ceiling. The landlord had repainted it when Strickland took the bungalow. Unless you knew how Indian bungalows were built, you would never have suspected that above the cloth lay the dark three-cornered cavern of the roof, where the beams and the underside of the thatch harboured all manner of rats, bats, ants, and foul things. Tietjens met me in the veranda with a bay like the boom of the bell of St. Paul's, putting her paws on my shoulder to show me she was glad to see me. Strickland had contrived to claw together a sort of meal which he called lunch, and immediately after it was finished went out about his business. I was left alone with Tietjens and my own affairs. The heat of the summer had broken up and turned to the warm damp of the rains. There was no motion in the heated air, but the rain fell like ramrods on the earth, and flung up a blue mist when it splashed back. The bamboos and the custard apples, the poinsettias and the mango trees in the garden, stood still while the warm water lashed through them, and the frogs began to sing among the aloe hedges. A little before the light failed, and when the rain was at its worst, I sat in the back veranda and heard the water roar from the eaves, and scratched myself because I was covered with a thing called prickly heat. Tietjens came out with me and put her head in my lap, and was very sorrowful, so I gave her biscuits when tea was ready, and I took tea in the back veranda on account of the little coolness found there. The rooms of the house were dark behind me. I could smell Strickland's saddlery and the oil on his guns, and I had no desire to sit among these things. My own servant came to me in the twilight, the muslin of his clothes clinging tightly to his drenched body, and told me that a gentleman had called and wished to see someone. Very much against my will, but only because of the darkness of the rooms, I went into the naked drawing-room, telling my man to bring the lights. There might or might not have been a caller waiting. It seemed to me that I saw a figure by one of the windows. But when the lights came there was nothing save the spikes of the rain without, and the smell of the drinking earth in my nostrils. I explained to my servant that he was no wiser than he ought to be, and went back to the veranda to talk to Tietjens. She had gone out into the wet, and I could hardly coax her back to me, even with biscuits with sugar tops. Strickland came home, dripping wet, just before dinner, and the first thing he said was, "'Has any one called?' I explained with apologies that my servant had summoned me into the drawing-room on a false alarm, or that some loafer had tried to call on Strickland, and thinking better of it had fled after giving his name. Strickland ordered dinner, without comment, and since it was a real dinner with a white tablecloth attached, we sat down. At nine o'clock Strickland wanted to go to bed, and I was tired too. Tietjens, who had been lying underneath the table, rose up and swung into the least exposed veranda as soon as her master moved to his own room, which was next to the stately chamber set apart for Tietjens. If a mere wife had wished to sleep out of doors in that pelting rain, it would not have mattered, but Tietjens was a dog, and therefore the better animal. I looked at Strickland, expecting to see him flay her with a whip. He smiled queerly, as a man would smile after telling some unpleasant domestic tragedy. "'She has done this ever since I moved in here,' said he. "'Let her go.' The dog was Strickland's dog, so I said nothing, but I felt all that Strickland felt, in being thus made light of. Tietjens encamped outside my bedroom window, and storm after storm came up, thundered on the thatch, and died away. The lightning spattered the sky, as a thrown egg spatters a barn door, but the light was pale blue, not yellow, and, looking through my split bamboo blinds, I could see the great dog standing, not sleeping, in the veranda, the hackles a lift on her back, and her feet anchored as tensely as the drawn wire-rope of a suspension bridge. In the very short pauses of the thunder I tried to sleep, but it seemed so someone wanted me very urgently. He, whoever he was, was trying to call me by name, but his voice was no more than a husky whisper. The thunder ceased, and Tietjens went into the garden and howled at the low moon. Somebody tried to open my door, walked about and about through the house, and stood breathing heavily in the verandas, and just when I was falling asleep I fancied that I heard a wild hammering and clamoring above my head or on the door. I ran into Strickland's room and asked him whether he was ill and had been calling for me. 
He was lying on his bed half-dressed, a pipe in his mouth. "'I thought you'd come,' he said. "'Have I been walking around the house recently?' I explained that he had been tramping in the dining-room, and the smoking-room, and two or three other places, and he laughed and told me to go back to bed. I went back to bed, and slept till the morning, but through all my mixed dreams I was sure I was doing someone an injustice in not attending to his wants. What those wants were I could not tell, but a fluttering, whispering, bolt-fumbling, lurking, loitering someone was reproaching me for my slackness and half awake I heard the howling of Tietjens in the garden, and the threshing of the rain. I lived in that house for two days. Strickland went to his office daily, leaving me alone for eight rotten hours with Tietjens for my only companion. As long as the full light lasted I was comfortable, and so was Tietjens, but in the twilight she and I moved into the back veranda and cuddled each other for company. We were alone in the house, but none the less it was much too fully occupied by a tenant with whom I did not wish to interfere. I never saw him, but I could see the curtains between the rooms quivering where he had just passed through. I could hear the chairs creaking as the bamboos sprung under a weight that had just quitted them, and I could feel when I went to get a book from the dining-room that somebody was waiting in the shadows of the front veranda till I should have gone away. Chechens made the twilight more interesting by glaring into the darkened rooms with every hair erect, and following the motions of something that I could not see. She never entered the rooms, but her eyes moved interestedly. That was quite sufficient. Only when my servant came to trim the lamps and make all light and habitable would she come in with me and spend her time sitting on her haunches, watching an invisible extra man as he moved about behind my shoulder. Dogs are cheerful companions. I explained to Strickland, gently as might be, that I would go over to the club and find for myself quarters there. I admired his hospitality, was pleased with his guns and rods, but I did not much care for his house and its atmosphere. He heard me out to the end, and then smiled very wearily, but without contempt, for he is a man who understands things. "'Stay on,' he said, and see what this thing means. All you have talked about I have known since I took the bungalow.' "'Stay on and wait. Tietjens has left me. Are you going too?' I had seen him through one little affair, connected with a heathen idol, that had brought me to the doors of a lunatic asylum, and I had no desire to help him through further experiences. He was a man to whom unpleasantnesses arrived as do dinners to ordinary people. Therefore I explained more clearly than ever that I liked him immensely, and would be happy to see him in the daytime, but that I did not care to sleep under his roof. This was after dinner, when Chetens has gone out to lie in the veranda. "'Pon my soul, I don't wonder,' said Strickland, with his eyes on the ceiling-cloth. "'Look at that!' The tails of two brown snakes were hanging between the cloth and the cornice of the wall. They threw long shadows in the lamplight. "'If you are afraid of snakes, of course,' said Strickland. "'I hate and fear snakes, because if you look into the eyes of any snake, you will see that it knows all and more of the mystery of man's fall, and that it feels all the contempt that the devil felt when Adam was evicted from Eden. Besides which, its bite is generally fatal, and it twists up trouser-legs. "'You ought to get your thatch overhauled,' I said. "'Give me a masseer rod, and we'll poke em down.' "'They'll hide among the roof-beams,' said Strickland. "'I can't stand snakes overhead. I'm going up into the roof.' If I shake him down, stand by with a cleaning-rod and break their backs. I was not anxious to assist Strickland in his work, but I took the cleaning-rod and waited in the dining-room while Strickland brought a gardener's ladder from the veranda, and set it against the side of the room. The snake-tails drew themselves up and disappeared. We could hear the dry, rushing scuttle of long bodies running over the baggy ceiling-cloth. Strickland took a lamp with him, while I tried to make clear to him the danger of hunting roof-snakes between a ceiling-cloth and a thatch, apart from the deterioration of property caused by ripping out ceiling-cloths. "'Nonsense!' said Strickland. "'They're sure to hide near the walls by the cloth. The bricks are too cold for them, and the heat of the room is just what they like.' He put his hand to the corner of the stuff, and ripped it from the cornice. It gave with a great sound of tearing, and Strickland put his head through the opening into the dark of the angle of the roof-beams. I set my teeth and lifted the rod, for I had not the least knowledge of what might descend. "'Hm,' said Strickland, and his voice rolled and jumbled in the roof. 
"'There's room for another set of rooms up here, and by Jove someone is occupying them. "'Snakes?' I said from below. "'No. It's a buffalo. Hand me up the la two last joints of a masseer rod, and I'll prod it. It's lying on the main roof beam.' I handed up the rod. "'What a nest for owls and serpents! No wonder the snakes live here,' said Strickland, climbing farther onto the roof. I could see his elbow thrusting with the rod. "'Come out of that, whoever you are. Heads below there. It's falling!' I saw the ceiling-cloth nearly in the centre of the room, bag with a shape that was pressing it downwards and downwards toward the lighted lamp on the table. I snatched the lamp out of danger and stood back. Then the cloth ripped out from the walls, tore, split, swayed, and shot down upon the table, something that I dared not look at, till Strickland had slid down the ladder and was standing by my side. He did not say much, being a man of few words, but he picked up the loose end of the tablecloth and threw it over the remnants on the table. "'It strikes me,' he said, putting down the lamp, "'our friend Imray has come back.' "'Oh, you would, would you?' There was a movement under the cloth, and a little snake wriggled out to be back-broken by the butt of the masseer rod. I was sufficiently sick to make no remarks worth recording. Strickland meditated and helped himself to drinks. The arrangement under the cloth made no more signs of life. "'Is it Imray?' I said. Strickland turned back to the cloth for a moment and looked. "'It is Imray,' he said, and his throat is cut from ear to ear. Then we spoke both together and to ourselves. "'That's why he whispered about the house.' Tietjens in the garden began to bay furiously. A little later her great nose heaved open the dining-room door. She snuffed and was still. The tattered ceiling-cloth hung down almost to the level of the table, and there was hardly room to move away from the discovery. Tietjens came in and sat down, her teeth bared under her lip and her forepaws planted. She looked at Strickland. "'It's a bad business, old lady,' said he. "'Men don't climb up into the roofs of their bungalows to die, and they don't fasten up the ceiling-cloth behind them. Let's think it out.' "'Let's think it out somewhere else,' I said. "'Excellent idea. Turn the lamps out. We'll get into my room.' I did not turn the lamps out. I went into Strickland's room first, and allowed him to make the darkness. Then he followed me, and we lit tobacco and thought. Strickland thought. I smoked furiously, because I was afraid. "'Imray is back,' said Strickland. "'The question is, who killed Imray? Don't talk.' I have a notion of my own. When I took this bungalow, I took over most of Imray's servants. Imray was guileless and inoffensive, wasn't he? I agreed, though the heap under the cloth had looked neither one thing nor the other. If I call in all the servants, they will stand fast in a crowd and lie like Aryans. What do you suggest? Call them in one by one, I said. They'll run away and give the news to all their fellows, said Strickland. We must segregate them. "'Do you suppose your servant knows anything about it?' Oh, "'He may, for aught I know, but I don't think it's likely. "'He has only been here two or three days,' I answered. "'What's your notion?' "'I can't quite tell. "'How the dickens did the man get the wrong side of the ceiling-cloth?' "'There was a heavy coughing outside Strickland's bedroom door. "'This showed that Badahur Khan, his body-servant, "'had waked from sleep and wished to put Strickland to bed. "'Come in,' said Strickland. It's a very warm night, isn't it? Bahadur Khan, a great green turban six-foot Mohammedan, said that it was a very warm night, but that there was more rain pending, which, by his honour's favour, would bring relief to the country. It will be so, if God pleases, said Strickland, tugging off his boots. It is in my mind, Bahadur Khan, that I have worked thee remorselessly for many days, ever since that time when thou first camest into my service. What time was that? Has the heaven-born forgotten? It was when Imre Sahib went secretly to Europe without warning given, and I, even I, came into the honoured service of the protector of the poor. And Imre Sahib went to Europe? It is so said among those who were his servants. And thou wilt take service with him when he returns? Assuredly, Sahib. He was a good master, and cherished his dependents. That is true. I am very tired, but I go buck-shooting to-morrow. "'Give me the little sharp rifle that I use for black buck. "'It is in the case yonder.' 
The man stooped over the case, handed barrels, stock, and foreign to Strickland, who fitted all together, yawning dolefully. Then he reached down to the gun case, took a solid drawn cartridge, and slipped it into the breech of the 360 Express. And Imre Sahib has gone to Europe secretly. That is very strange, Bahadur Khan, is it not? What do I know of the ways of the white man, heaven-born? Very little, truly, but thou shalt know more anon. It has reached me that Imre Sahib has returned from his so long journeyings, and that even now he lies in the next room, waiting his servant. Sahib! The lamplight slid along the barrels of the rifle as they levelled themselves at Bahadur Khan's broad breast. Go and look, said Strickland. Take a lamp. Thy master is tired, and he waits thee. Go. The man picked up a lamp and went into the dining room, Strickland following, and almost pushing him with the muzzle of the rifle. He looked for a moment at the black depths behind the ceiling cloth, at the writhing snake underfoot, and last a grey glaze settling on his face, at the thing under the tablecloth. "'Hast thou seen?' said Strickland, after a pause. "'I have seen. I am clay in the white man's hands. What does the presence do?' "'Hang thee within the month. What else?' "'For killing him? Nay, Sahib, consider.' Walking among us, his servants, he cast his eyes upon my child, who was four years old. Him he bewitched, and in ten days he died of the fever, my child! What said Emre Sahib? He said he was a handsome child, and patted him on the head. Wherefore my child died. Wherefore I killed Emre Sahib in the twilight, when he had come back from office and was sleeping. Wherefore I dragged him up into the roof-beams, and made all fast behind him. The heaven-born knows all things. I am the servant of the heaven-born." Strickland looked at me above the rifle, and said in the vernacular, "'Thou art witness to the saying? He has killed.' Bahadur Khan stood ashen grey in the light of the one lamp. The need for justification came upon him very swiftly. "'I am trapped,' he said. "'But the offence was that man's. He cast an evil eye upon my child, and I killed and hid him only such as are served by devils. He glared at Tietjens, couched stolidly before him. Only such could know what I did. It was clever, but thou shouldst have lashed him to the beam with a rope. Now thou thyself wilt hang by a rope. Orderly! A drowsy policeman answered Strickland's call. He was followed by another, and Tietjens sat wondrous still. "'Take him to the police station,' said Strickland. "'There is a case to ward.' "'Do I hang, then?' said Bahadur Khan, making no attempt to escape, and keeping his eyes on the ground. "'If the sun shines or the water runs, yes,' said Strickland. Bahadur Khan stepped back one long pace, quivered, and stood still. The two policemen waited for their orders. "'Go!' said Strickland. "'Nay, but I go very swiftly,' said Bahadur Khan. "'Look! I am even now a dead man.' He lifted his foot, and to the little toe there clung the head of the half-killed snake, firm fixed in the agony of death. "'I come of land-holding stock,' said Bahadur Khan, rocking where he stood. "'It were a disgrace to me to go to the public scaffold. Therefore I take this way. Be it remember that the sahib's shirts are correctly enumerated, and that there is an extra piece of soap in his wash-basin. My child was bewitched, and I slew the wizard. Why should you seek to slay me with the rope? My honour is saved, and—and—I die." At the end of an hour he died, as they die who are bitten by the little brown karit, and the policemen bore him and the thing under the tablecloth to their appointed places. All were needed to make clear the disappearance of Imre. This, said Strickland, very calmly, as he climbed into bed, is called the nineteenth century. Did you hear what that man said? I heard, I answered. Imre made a mistake. Simply and solely through not knowing the nature of the Oriental, and the coincidence of a little seasonal fever. Bahadur Khan had been with him for four years. I shuddered. My own servant had been with me for exactly that length of time. When I went over to my own room I found my man waiting, impassive as the copper head on a penny, to pull off my boots. "'What has befallen Bahadur Khan?' said I. "'He was bitten by a snake and died. 
The rest the Sahib knows, was the answer. And how much of this matter hast thou known? As much as might be gathered from one coming in in the twilight to seek satisfaction. Gently, Sahib, let me pull off those boots. I had just settled to the sleep of exhaustion when I heard Strickland shouting from his side of the house, Chechens has come back to her place! And so she had. The great deer hound was couched statelily on her own bedstead, on her own blanket, while in the next room the idle empty ceiling cloth waggled as it trailed on the table. End of the Return of Imray by Rudyard Kipling. Recorded in Toronto, Ontario by Moyer Fogarty, October 2006.